this is very interesting. And it, it leads us uh, very well into our next topic. And already there was some anticipation about that um, in regards to fire safety. And Danielle, I see that you're online. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you too. Um, are you able to share your screen? Yes, let me give it a shot now. Okay. How's that working? It looks really great. So Daniela, I don't have a specific introduction for you. Um, so why don't you go ahead and, and give us uh, your, your, um, your own in illustrious introduction and tell us about si fire safety in humanitarian settings. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm actually very quickly gonna pass the buck to Phil Deloy <laughs> if he's on so you can kind of open up our session. Phil, are you there? Yeah, I am. Hi, Danielle. <clears throat> Hi, Danielle. Hi, Jen. Hi, everybody. Hope, hope you're all keeping well. Nice to see you again. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a week since I was last, last here. It's been a busy one, but I uh, hope everyone's good. Um, yeah, so uh, Danielle and Jim and Liz and I, uh, maybe next slide if, uh, if you would, Danielle, have been working uh, together as sort of core members of, of what is really a much wider group of uh, interdisciplinary folk um, looking at fire risk management in humanitarian settings in and out of camp um, from preparedness to recovery and all sorts. So yeah, I'm, I'm an advisor to, to the UK government for FCDO. Uh, Danielle is, uh, is founder and exec director for Kindling, which is a, a, a new NGO. It's been around for a little over a year now. Um, Liz, who's been on the chat earlier, uh, is global construction lead, lead for SAVE. And Jim, I think, well, if ever there's a person who doesn't need an intro, it's, it's him. But, you know, he's a bit of a, a maestro of, of site planning and, and a whole range of other things. And very lucky, indeed, to, to have him on board as well. Uh, but, yeah, the four of us have sort of been the linchpin for and trying to draw in and, and make that group larger. And, and we only had space for four pictures. So apologies to, to other folk who have been making really meaningful uh, contributions as well. So um, to, to describe what we're gonna talk about today, if we could go to the next slide, if you don't mind, Danielle, um, we're gonna be looking at, you know, what, what is the nature of the risk? What's, and what's the incidence of it? Um, we're going to briefly touch on uh, input that we had from a global shelter cluster uh, session, much like these ones that we're holding today, which happened last week. Uh, time's gotten a little elastic in the, in the pandemic, probably for everybody. Um, and then we're going to draw in how um, minimum standards for camp management can assist in fire risk mitigation um, in all of its different forms without putting all the burden on CCCM colleagues. That for me is really critical. This is, this needs to be a shared risk. It doesn't currently, you know, we've been going on and on about how like fire safety doesn't fall within any one cluster. So it falls through the cracks. What I really wouldn't want to see is now that we've got like safety, you know, sort of front and center in, in um, standard 3.1, we, we can't accept for it to go to CCCM. Um, it, it just, it, it is all of our problem, um, but it may give us the beginnings of a framework to look at how that risk can be owned and how we can contribute to a more meaningful collective ownership and addressing that risk a bit more meaningfully. And some of the efforts that are uh, happening to address it, which um, I would say that, you know, Danielle, Jim and, and Liz are, are really doing some great work in um, and I will describe and, and indeed let my colleagues describe just how that is happening. So without further ado, Danielle, I pass back to you. Thanks. Over. Thank you, Phil. Um, so I'm going to provide a quick overview of fire risk and humanitarian settlements, very, very quick, in fact, um, and a little bit about our recent panel discussion. Um, there really are no global statistics for fires in humanitarian settings, but the settlements of displaced communities are particularly susceptible to fires due to the combustible nature of commonly used shelter materials, the methods and fuels used for cooking, heating, and lighting, um, and the densely built nature of many sites, among many other factors. Small fires quickly evolve into long, 
large conflagrations, as you can see in this example from Nigeria on the screen. Um, and this causes significant losses of life, livelihoods and property, many injuries, and just exacerbations of the existing vulnerabilities of affected populations. On June 4th, a fire broke out at the Sharia camp in Duhok, Iraq, which houses displaced Yazidis. The fire destroyed 290 tents, displaced 130 families, and injured 35 people. The consequences of fire go far beyond the obvious physical damage, though, and this quote really captures that. A Yazidi woman affected by the fire said, today was worse than the 3rd of August 2014 when ISIS attacked us. And fires like these frequently harm displaced persons and undermine humanitarian assistance, but most do not make international headlines. Some of the better known fires from the past year are shown here on the screen. And ultimately improving fire safety is a matter of protection and accountability to affected populations. But as Phil said, fire often falls through the cracks of the cluster approach. Fire is a very cross-cutting issue that is everyone's and therefore no one's responsibility. It's rarely referenced meaningfully. There's a lack of data illustrating the scale of this risk and a lack of ownership by any global cluster, sector, and agency because of its cross-cutting nature. So coordination between agencies, clusters, affected populations, and definitely local governments, especially the fire services, is urgently needed to develop an effective approach. Camp coordination and camp management has a particularly important role to play with fire safety. And in a few minutes, my colleagues, Jim and Liz, will share more about fire safety through the lens to construction management minimum standards. But first, I wanna to quickly touch on some of the key insights from our recent panel discussion, the Global Shelter Cluster Annual Meeting. Um, we were joined by the six panelists shown on the screen who shared insights from their diverse experiences working as both researchers and practitioners on fire risk reduction in humanitarian settlements and informal settlements. Collectively, these panelists have worked on fire safety in settlements in Lebanon, Kenya, South Sudan, South Africa, Bangladesh, and Thailand. And we really encourage you to go watch the recording of the session on YouTube. Um, I'll drop the link into the chat. It was only a 45 minute discussion, so it's a very easy thing to watch, but I promise you we could have gone on for like three hours in this meeting. Um, so there's a lot more maybe where that's coming from. Um, during the event, our discussion was quite focused on fire preparedness and fire response. Um, and when I say fire response, we really wanna be quite specific here. We're talking about the time during the actual fire, from ignition to fire extinguishment. We're not talking about humanitarian response, which is maybe years, of response or disaster response, which is often after the event and the, the hours and days following a large acute disaster. Um, so this is really about the opportunity that people have to respond during a, fire, during a fire incident and to have systems in place to support that response. So some of the key takeaways are, again, thinking about the time of fire response and the opportunity that it presents during a fire. Um, we really need to focus in on people's capacities, vulnerabilities, and past experiences and how that shapes responses to fire. Um, thinking about things such as the repeated experiences of fire. Um, many displaced persons have been um, victims of fire being used as a weapon in some of the places they've come from. So there's often psychological aspects of fire as well as um, just generally having been exposed to fire many different times. Um, and then certain things like age, gender, disabilities, and other, other aspects that might contribute to vulnerabilities really need to be considered. Um, and need to think about how you can also have kind of gendered specific or child-friendly type of fire safety is also quite important. Um, there are many options for physical and social interventions to reduce fire risk. And this is really an important point to make. I think often fire seems like such a difficult thing to tackle that sometimes it's not, not addressed, but actually there's a lot of things that we can do to reduce fire risk. Um, but most important is a communications coordination and community empowerment. So we really need to focus on, on how we can bring stakeholders together and try to tackle this collectively. Um, some of the key stakeholders to mention are, of course, the site population and humanitarian agencies, but also the local fire services. So engagement local government, which are, you know, local fire services are often a government group, are very important, and often people from the fire services are coming from the host community. So it actually presents an opportunity to engage with the, the host community in a productive way. Um, and finally, as a cross-cutting issue, fire safety needs to be mainstreamed into humanitarian action. It is a multi-sectoral issue requiring a holistic and cohesive approach. 
Um, but yeah, again, I, I kind of encourage you to go watch that, that session and learn more. Back over to you, Phil, thanks. Great, thanks very much, Danielle. Um, so the uh, the standards, of course, are uh, are super new um, and super exciting, and I think a, a lot of different people are looking at you know how are these going going to be changing things for me, for my agency, for how coordination works. Um, stepping, sort of zooming back from them a little bit. I mean, um, as I as I mentioned a week ago, like my my default position is to sort of worry about layering a new standard on old ones because we end up with phone books and then people don't really aren't able to internalize enough of them to get the key messages to to deliver so i i generally want to see like kind of consolidation with humanitarian standards as i, I think everybody does you know for their own sanity but you know the the camp the minimum standard for camp management for me totally fills a gap um there it's it's not um it's not adding on something that is a, a global standard. Yeah, we've got the tool, the toolkit and so on, which I want to acknowledge, but like, you know, from a from a global standards perspective, there's been a huge gap, which this fills thanks to it. It's really good um, development process. Um, it helps to ensure better AAP representation, uh, enabled governance and safety, um, really clear and as widely applicable as possible. Um, they enable our sector to address safety, uh, including fire risks of displaced people better than uh, better than what was out there. Um, as I said before, this doesn't mean that camp managers are suddenly responsible for it. Um, rather, uh, they're a tool on which to evaluate how it's being delivered. And we can now, with this, uh, assess, verify, and then offer targeted support. So you know, these different things are coming together at about the right time, I would say, keeping pace with each other. What are the means that we can offer in terms of targeted support? Um, and this is the kind of thing that, that Danielle's been leading on. Um, so I think, yeah, these standards raise the bar for everybody. I, I, I probably have stressed that just about enough. Um, and we can then hold ourselves and others to account. So they give the tools um, for humanitarians to draw from donors. Um, better consideration for fire risk. They give humanitarians the tool to advocate to host governments to set better conditions in evacuation centers. Um, and they give humanitarians and governments the tools to push for better settlement planning, among other things. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Jim and to Liz to elaborate their views on the five standards in front of us now. Over from me. Thanks. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, and uh, just to say, I'm, I'm sure that uh, everybody uh, here today is by now very uh, aware of this slide. Um, so I'm not going to run through it uh, again. What I'd like to do and um, uh, with Liz's help is actually um, start to connect some of the standards with specific aspects of fire safety. Um, and I think it, you know, uh, both uh, Kelly in the uh, presentation previously, uh, but also um, uh, Phil and Danielle have highlighted already uh, some of the uh, connections which must be obvious to everyone uh, regarding uh, a safe and secure environment and things like that, and how do we coordinate? Um, but I'd also like to maybe uh, draw out a couple of connections uh, with some of the other standards where the connection might not at first glance be, be so obvious. Um, and maybe starting with uh, some of the standards in the first column, um, standard 1.2 for life cycle planning. Um, and I think, you know, there's, um, a, a, a warning first here that uh, the, the the life cycle planning for a site is something that can be catastrophically set back by uh, by a fire um, and to the degree to which um, a, a large fire can actually not just bring everything back to to zero but make things worse than they were when people arrived and so therefore making sure that 
the life cycle of fire safety, that is, say, that is fire risk reductions, uh, fire risk mitigation, um, the fire response during a fire and then fire recovery is something that is actually integrated into life cycle planning uh, as a set of cycles, hopefully cycles that can be broken by making sure that there aren't fires or that fires are much better contained, but looking to how that works in each step of the site life cycle uh, from the first installation and the first establishment of management and other service delivery. Um, and I think then uh, the site management agency and team capacity um, becomes very, very central. What, uh, what do we need to ask the teams in terms of what they would like for uh, bringing on board discussions, learnings for uh, fire, fire safety, uh, risk mitigation, response actions um, into, uh, into their work. Um, and then in a second column, uh, community participation. We all have so many good examples uh, of community participation in community patrols, community outreach, uh, community uh, trainings, um, but maybe we also need to combine that, for, uh, particularly for fire safety, and given the wide range of sites where we find ourselves working, um, with the governance mechanisms and structures, um, and also with the information sharing and looking both inside the site communities and outside. Um, how many times has anybody sat at a coordination meeting anywhere in the world and sat down next to somebody from the local fire response services? Um, uh, I leave that as an open question. Um, but then also um, standard 2.4, feedback and complaints. Um, I think there um, you, we can see um, ways of firstly closing a cycle of information very obviously. I think one thing to be very careful of um, is uh, sort of do no harm and fire safety and feedback and complaints um, because very often um, in the aftermath of a fire uh, there is a sort of blame game. Uh, we've seen that in some of the media reports uh, in some larger fires in southern Europe over the last six months, for instance. And so therefore, part of fire safety and part of the investigation after fires needs to have uh, open, fair, uh, accessible ways for there to be feedback and complaints without it becoming something which uh, becomes a, as I said, a blame game and which in effect closes down actual investigation. I'm going to hand over to Liz for the next two columns of standards, um, but then coming back for site closure and exit planning. Well, hello, everyone. This is Liz Palmer, dialing in from Cape Town. I'm the uh, Global Construction Lead for Save the Children. Um, and I just want to say in advance of, of the presentation how amazing the set of standards are. I really feel like they fill the gap in the market. And it's just it's so wonderful to have such clarity in such a beautiful package document. I know it's still, still your field testing. and when I found a few spelling mistakes, so I'll come back to you on that. <laughs> but it's really great, and it's just wonderful to see um, that this kind of push towards site safety, particularly where um, you have, uh, you know, really def defined the, the needs for an action plan and risk assessment, um, where something like fire safety should be included, and I think very often it's not. And we'll come back to, um, you know, obviously the, the the bigger picture around community and stakeholder engagement and the requirements that are required for, you know, for, for fire safety, where as Danielle said in the beginning, it's everyone's responsibility and therefore is such an overlooked category of risk in, in these collective environments. Um, so obviously the behavior change that's required by even the children and uh, the refugees is as important as it is to have the response capacity of the NGO sector, as well as the, 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 the respond, you know, fire responders. Um, and setting up a, a safe environment for fire is so important. As we know, the, the, the site planning standards in sphere are, are very limited in terms of what they say. Uh, you know, a fire break here or whatever, but obviously setting up things such as an address system uh, for raising the alarm about fire. You mentioned that in your camp standards about uh, about um, the site management agency uh, ensuring that, that it's accessible. 
uh, to everyone and something like a fire address system would obviously be need to be included in that, particularly because fire moves so fast um, and the, the immediate need for people to, to flee um, and to act as well. Uh, the preparation of, 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 the, of the community in terms of evacuation procedures, particularly around identifying vulnerable community members who need assistance to leave. And I think another thing that's probably not very well known is that um, generally what's seen in, especially in informal settlements in South Africa, is the first thing that happens when there's a fire is that people tend to, tend to become very altruistic and they go back for their family members and they create a forward backward movement that can complicate fire response, uh, as well as you know where we put in place obstructions such as fencing. And I don't need to highlight in which environment I'm, I'm referring to. It's a very highly contested situation, but so, so, so important that that has also been taken into account in our planning. And of course, under the coordination mandate of the site, site management agency, this aspect is really, really critical to be overseen by a focal point who's got these aspects of risk in mind, particularly when it comes to identifying both prevention and preparedness activities by the community and involving the community. Um, and I'll just come back to this thing about the immediate response also is, uh, is this aspect of uh, uh, running backwards and forwards. They not only go back for their family members, but they go back for their belongings. And in some cases, we see them moving some valuable items, if they have them, into the road and block the access of the emergency responders. So again, another aspect of coordination under site management that can really be addressed um, you know, at all levels of stakeholder engagement. And I think the, 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 the kind of activities that have been identified in standards uh, three and four, the site environment and the coordination and monitoring, so important. Um, to support the construction, uh, the, the fire safety aspects of, of camp management. Thank you very much, over. Um, back to me for the last standard. Um, very quickly, just because a site is closing doesn't mean that fire safety risks have gone away. Uh, we all know that uh, even if it's an unplanned closure, um, it may take, uh, take a process over a period of time. Um, very often there's this uh, combination of already abandoned shelters and those still occupied by the most vulnerable, the least able perhaps to evacuate from a sudden fire. And so therefore thinking about what an adapted, evolved fire safety set of SOPs is for the entire closure and one that could be activated um, in case of an unplanned closure becomes paramount. And this also goes in terms of um, looking to see what the fire safety risks are for rehabilitation and decommissioning for um, the eventual removal of remaining materials. Uh, but also thinking back at standard 5.1, who do we hand this over to and who do we hand this over from? Uh, to echo Phil, is it just going to be sitting on the laps of the camp managers to go around finding out which local municipal office might have the responsibility during a handover to, uh, to another agency? Um, those are, I hope, a couple of provocative thoughts uh, framed in the, in the standards. Um, and I'm going to hand back to, I think, Danielle for the last segment. Think it may be to me, but don't let me jump in your way, Danielle. If you wanted to come in, no, oh, Phil, it's over on. to you. Phil, go ahead. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so so Jim has laid out some really provocative points uh, for this next slide, which is for Q and A. So I'm not going to have any hesitation in in directing uh, questions straight back to you, Jim. Um, but <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I know we've seen some some good questions in the chat, including. Um, you know, why don't we look at safe havens, um, setting up voluntary fire brigades and so on. You know, these are some of the um, like best practices that, that Kindling and others are, are really looking to, to capture and see what the evidence basis is for those, including for fire incidents itself. Um, so I guess if there aren't any other questions at, at this moment, I'll, I'll just mention something that I think is really key. Um, this fire safety initiative, um, its strength is the diversity of participants. Um, 
their expertise, their experience, their contextual knowledge. Um, and I think that without, you know, folks coming in from a variety of disciplines, from a variety of locations, um, we're not going to be able to supply the information to meet the gaps that have that are being identified. Um, I want to highlight that, you know, the, the camp management standard is strong because of those inputs and any fire risk mitigation initiative is going to be strong for for the same reasons. Um, and that there are uh, a, a real range of opportunities to be involved in this um, from, you know, low commitment like, hey, have you considered this and just pinging us an email to, you know, actually having significant influence in, in the direction. Or if you if you want the third option, um, you know, you could be uh, on a mailing list uh, and just add your email to it so that when um, when when mailers are put out, you're you're able to keep up to speed with uh, with the kind of uh, things that are happening um, as as this uh, develops. Um, so please do pop your questions in the chat. Take off mute. Just jump right in. Some really good points already from uh, from Omar and Cecilia. Anyone else uh, wants to come in? Please do. Good to know from Brian as well that there have been some nascent efforts towards um, camp-based fire brigades. Yeah, hi Phil. This is Liz again. I actually wanted to quickly respond to that um, to that question. I think it's so 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 important. And what would be so great is if we could get examples of the training programs that are happening around the world and start to map what's working. Um, I think you know, in, in Save the Children, we initiated a fire risk reduction assessment in Lebanon, which was a nationwide activity that that pulled in a whole lot of uh, coordination at all levels of stakeholders. And, and we're, we're striving to get some funding if anybody's interested in stepping in to help us with an evaluation of that program. But one, a lot of the activities centered around the capacity of refugees and their ability to respond to fire. So we talk about things like the, um, you know, the, the fire, fire evacuation procedures and everybody having a role to play, some to evacuate, some to act as fire wardens and some to respond. Um, and the fire safety training uh, came, came with uh, fire safety kits, including fire extinguishers, and also um, big hooks to pull rows of shelters down to create fire breaks if a fire was to, to start. Um, so there's multiple layers of stakeholder engagement and training that can be put into place where everyone in the community has a role to play. And that coordinated role is something that we um, you know, would strive to achieve through the, through the site management agency coordination levels. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think if anyone does have uh, examples, I, I see we've got a number from Nigeria, etc. It'd be great to, to, to gather that, uh, that program data and see what we can learn from it and, and what can be disseminated uh, to a broader audience. Thank you. Yeah, th <coughs> excuse me. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, Danielle, could we go to the next slide, if you don't mind? Um, so this slide uh, gives a, a bit of an idea of, of what uh, BHA uh, via the Global Shelter Cluster and um, UK Aid is match funding um, for this uh, sort of conglomerates, uh, he hesitate to use the word confederation uh, coming from the USA, but you know, a group of disparate entities working together for a common purpose. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're really, I think, breaking new ground and looking at, you know, what is the incidence of fire in humanitarian settlements? There is no current um, sort of list or database of those apart from what Kindling is working on. And, and Kindling's getting support from a, a huge range of actors, uh, too numerous to name perhaps. But then, yeah, looking at uh, what works in what kinds of locations and, the idea is to consolidate all of that, all of these tools and methods used for fire detection, for alert, for suppression, for pre-education, for recovery, um, pull all that from as many locations and, and people as possible, and then thematize that information and then put back practicable, useful information for the benefit of everyone in the sector and perhaps to, uh, to help people understand that it is not purely a a camp management responsibility, but something that we can all contribute to meaningfully. Um, I want to highlight the QR code at the bottom right of the screen. And hopefully uh, in sight, there is a 
uh, a shortened um, website address, a bit.ly address. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, so it may be worth our um, putting that in, in the chat. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you by signing up to have a newsletter, there is no like, we're not going to impinge on your time. Um, it's just we would love to hear more, you know, got some great examples in the chat and, and would love to hear more from you, even 15 minutes to just describe how it's working, what are the challenges with it. Um, and then we can explore the degree to which those methods can be replicated elsewhere in the world. Um, and hopefully, um, yeah, reduce um, reduce the loss of life, and um, and and homes um, and infrastructure. And yeah, oh, thank you so much, Brian, for for putting that in the chat. Um, and yeah, looking forward to hearing from you all. I realize I've got about one minute left, so I think we'll move perhaps to uh, to the last slide, if if you don't mind, Danielle which is basically a, a huge thanks for, uh, for allowing us this platform and, um, and to, again, draw a little bit of a parallel between gap filling from the amazing new camp management minimum standard and, uh, and this fire initiative. That's it from us. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Phil, Liz, Jim. Danielle, it was it was really interesting, and I'm reminded of so many different discussions that we had when we were, you know, developing the training materials just recently for Greece about the trust that breaks down when there's things like fires as well. So, um, thank you so much for that that bringing in the minimum standards. I wasn't expecting that in relationship to the presentation on fire safety. So, um, Liz, don't go very far because your um, construction good practice standards are next together with Shane and Kihara. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, great. So um, I see a, a couple things um, in the chat. Thanking uh, Juan for again, bringing in the, the IEC safety materials that we were talking about this morning. So there is quite a lot of synergy between what we were talking about in the first um, block of uh, practitioners discussions this morning about participation and um, information that was being shared for learning and education during the first uh, sessions this morning and thank you very much and